But the first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Clancy. Uh, Michael Clancy from FBT um, has been working with us for many, many years on this project as well and has done some fantastic work in the food and drink and many other sectors. And we're also joined by, uh, by Robert Haywood. Uh, Robert Haywood is from CPL uh, Consultants, a uh, business consultants. And uh, back in 1987, they were um, established and offering strategic advice on ingredients for food, feed, cosmetics, related sectors. And they've worked on numerous projects, valorizing side streams with potential applications in these markets over the past three decades. And I'll, I'll let Mike introduce himself a little bit more. And um, as I say, any problems with uh, any connection or anything else, put it in the chat box and we'll try and sort it out. But otherwise, I hope you enjoy the presentation. And, and over to you, Mike. Okay, thank you, Ali. Um, just uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping everybody can hear me. So, um, Michael Sands is my name. I'm, I'm a director with FTC Consulting Engineers. Uh, we've been established since 1991 as, as consultants, primarily in the beverage and food industries, but uh, working also in, in, in life sciences sector as well. Um, so, uh, and we've been involved over many years with uh, numerous sustainability projects, um, and I suppose Pure has, has, has the Pure project has stemmed from that. So without uh, further ado, I'll, I'll continue on. And um, my first slide here, if you can see it, um, the, you can see where I've crossed the word waste out and turned it into side streams. Um, to me, waste is something that uh, it's just a resource that is in the wrong place because everything should have a value uh, if, it, if it's been used, utilized correctly. And a number of things that we, we talk about as being waste water or waste resources or waste food. Uh, are not actually wasted, just we don't have, we haven't found a, a, a correct place to use them properly. So uh, we'll continue on from that from that point. Uh, so Ali said a number of you, if you don't know, um, you know what what polyphenols are, well you'll find out. So here we go. Um, so anyone who, who who did chemistry will understand what a phenol is. It's a benzene ring with a, a, a hydroxy um, molecule onto it, uh, also known as carbolic acid. And um, those of you of a certain vintage will uh, remember having your face scrubbed with carbolic soap, uh, which is the red stuff down in the corner here. So, uh, and a polyphenol is multiple phenols stuck together. Um, there's probably a better chemical term for that, um, and I've probably offended some of my colleagues from, with a chemistry background, but uh, essentially that's what polyphenols are, clumps of phenols stuck together uh, with other interesting molecules joined on in some cases. Uh, so. Um, and, and where do they come from? So typically, the way I like to describe polyphenols is that um, they're, they're typically produced by, um, by plants. They're, they come from other sources as well, but we're dealing with, with, with plant ones, plant-based ones here. Um, and what polyphenols are essentially is they're, they're a plant's natural uh, antimicrobial and antifungal um, protection system. So they're, they're found usually in the skins and peels and trunks of, of plants um, and stems, etc. So they're on the kind of outer bit that, that helps protect the plant. And um, just in terms of a very good example is an apple. So a large quantity of the polyphenols in apples are actually in the, in the peel. A certain amount are in the, the core as well, a significant amount. Very little is actually in the flesh. So again, I, I've given this, anyone who's heard me present before would be bored Hearing, hearing this, but I'll say it again, if you, if you take nothing else from this presentation, make sure you, you uh, get your kids to eat their apple skins because it's really important, that's where the good stuff is. Um, so, and you can see here, there's a numerous different types of polyphenols, so you'll see the, the benzene rings uh, within the apples. So polyphenols, where we came to this, polyphenols are, have some negative effects because they cause haze in beer, and they also, because of their antimicrobial effect, can cause issues in wastewater treatment plants, plants because they're, they're um, they have an antibiotic effect, but they're also high BOD. So from a positive point of view, they're antioxidants, they're antiseptic. Different polyphenols will have different, um, different properties. They're natural preservatives, and they're natural colorants in some instances as well. So just some, some applications here um, in terms of how they're used. So basically, on the left-hand side here, we have a number of extracts, uh, which you can walk into a, a pharmacy, and you can purchase a number of these, um, which are polyphenol-based extracts. Um, some of the interesting ones here, there's, there's one called Aplin, which is from apples. It's a, it's a polyphenol called uh, fluoricin that is in that, and that's produced as a, a byproduct of um, uh, pectin production. So polyphenols have color, and by taking out the color from the pectin, they produce a higher value pectin, 
but they also produce this polyphenol extract and that's a patent of the process. And uh, one of the other interesting ones there's the pycnogeno, which is an extract there, um, but it's also in use in one of these cosmetics on the right hand side. That comes from pine trees. Uh, you can see there's one there from kelp, which is from seaweed. Uh, and then the, 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 the couple from the couple of meat examples there are um, polyphenols are actually used as natural preservatives and they're used to because of their antimicrobial or sorry antioxidant effect on the lipids, the fats in the meat. So that's, that's a preservative effect on the meat product. And so these are actual real real applications that are in use currently. Um, so the Pure project uh, I suppose it, it's uh, the whole thing about this was, was extracting polyphenols from waste streams of other industries and, and waste streams of, of production plants, which typically were doing effectively, if you start to make polyphenols from scratch, you have a, a degree, high degree of pre-processing to do, which impacts on, on um, the cost of producing those polyphenols. So essentially what we're looking at doing is getting polyphenols from side streams uh, where the, the whole company effectively has done the pre-processing or a significant amount of the pre-processing for you. So they've got the polyphenols out of the skin or the husk or whatever else of the material. Um, they've also, and this is a benefit, is the host material, the host company has typically uh, got supply chain control measures in place so they're buying their ingredients from a known source, they have traceability, etc. So a lot of the polyphenols that are on the market are not necessarily, don't have the same traceability they're uh, maybe produced in, in, in countries where uh, there can be some issues around verification of the supply chain from a, a chemical to a pesticide point of view, etc. In Ireland, in some cases, we can trace the barley right back to the field and, and have full history of the, the agronomy that went into it. Um, so the business case for, for producing polyphenols is not just around the producing the polyphenol itself, it's also around the reduction in waste and the reduction in, in uh, with water produced, etc. So that's why essentially this is an environmental project as much as it is a, 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 a an ingredient project. Um, and the aim is to produce a high value polyphenol extract that somebody can can take and, and put into the marketplace. So just um, then a little around this project. So this project is a is a 1.6 million euro project co-funded by the Eco Dip Eco Innovation uh, Program under the EU. Um, and FTD had essentially had a, a, an idea which we had taken to a certain stage. We had we had validated our technology and validated our idea in in, in the lab. Um, and this project was all about taking that and taking it to the point where we had demonstrated that in an in an operational environment in a in a factory in a facility, demonstrated that we could produce significant quantities of commercial grade polyphenols, which we which which we have done. Um, so on the left hand side of the, the, the chart on the left here, um, you can see the kind of stages in the process that we, that we went through. And that's all the kind of techy stuff that as an engineering co consultancy and with scientific expertise as well uh, that, 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 that we're able to do. On the right hand side is the stuff that we're probably, it's probably not our core business and that's where we had to bring in, uh, and I'm very happy to bring in partners to, to work with us on that, and our, I'm going to hand over very shortly to Robert, um, who will talk about the, the, the route to market and the business model and the, the polyphenol extract customers, etc. We also brought in, we also did um, life cycle analysis. So we brought in a company called um, Eco Innovation from Italy, who have just finished our life cycle analysis on the project, which I'm happy to say has been has been positive. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Robert, and uh, he will talk more about the the, the market side of things. Okay, so over to you, Robert. Thanks, Michael. I'll pass you over to you, Robert, making you presenter now. Okay, <clears throat> can everyone see that? Looking good. So, good afternoon. So, I'm Robert Harwood, CEO of CPL. And, <clears throat> and as was said, yeah, we've worked in food ingredients for over many years, and we're very happy to be part of the Pure project looking at the commercial aspects of polyphenols. So I'm just going to do a short presentation around the markets of polyphenols and also some of the things you should look out for when, valid when valorizing your side streams. So, <clears throat> as Michael said, polyphenols are found in plants, 
many are potent free radical scavengers, so really good antioxidants. And studies show that they're involved in the modulation of enzyme activities and also the modulation of cell receptors. So they have some good, some very potent effects. The most abundant one on the market is grapeseed extract, which accounts for probably more than 50% of the total market. And these products are marketed for general antioxidant support. But there's also a good body of scientific research for high quality grapeseed extracts, which show they're good for heart health and, for example, reducing pre-hypertension and improved circulation of blood, the flexibility of arteries, increased calorie burning, nourishment of organs and muscles, helping them work more effectively, and enhanced physical endurance. So, really good stuff. So the total market from 2015 was about 3 billion. So there's a big market out there. The main companies in which these products are sold, US, Germany, France, Italy, and China. And in volume terms, it's approaching 17,000 tons and with good growth rates. The US market is sort of leads the global market and the European polyphenol market lags behind. And that's mainly due to differences in the regulatory environment, especially in what health claims you can make. The regulations in Europe are a lot stricter. And in the US, grapeseed extract has been successfully positioned as an anti-hypertensive product. So, <clears throat> where are these products sold? The first market I'm going to talk about is food and supplements. Dietary supplements are understood to account for about 90% of the market for grapeseed extract in Europe and North America by volume. For green tea, the long history of consumption is also, also suggests that it can be used well in food products. So as I said, the grapeseed polyphenol has a range of interesting health effects. And along with grape, grapeseed tea and apple-derived polyphenols, they make up a third of the global market. So, as I said, there's, there's been a, a large amount of research done into polyphenols. And in order to extract the most value from them, you have to be able to demonstrate their health effects. And this includes positive effects on aging, such as cognitive health, skin health, also for women's health and prostate health in men. Also, they have interesting anti-inflammatory properties, cardiovascular health, as I said. Some of them can act as prebiotics, so that's helping enhance your gut health and supporting the, the good bacteria in your gut. Also, they act as natural antioxidants and antimicrobials. They're often used in combination with other ingredients. And in order to increase their value, you have to test the claims which are made. There's also potential applications in animal health and nutrition. I mean, the animal nutrition business is huge. So worth about 14 billion globally just for the additives part of it, not for the complete feed. And feed production in Europe is about 155 million tons or above that. Poultry and pig feed accounts for 50 million tons. So you can see the, the volumes here are, are massive. And feed antioxidants are worth about 28 million. And polyphenols are used extensively. They permit the produ reduction of added vitamins C and E and provide additional benefits for feed utilization. So that's a conversion of feed into meat, as it were, or into milk. There are also several agricultural uses. Polyphenols are actually produced by plants, often in response to stress. So applying, to poly applying polyphenols to plants tricks them into thinking they're stressed and stimulates their natural defenses and responses to stress. So it's sort of, it's like an immune stimulant for plants. Also, polyphenols act as antifeedants and repellents for insects. That's often why they're produced in plants, to stop the, stop the plant being eaten. So there's also potential applications as biopesticides. 
So tannins are the most widely used as biostimulants. They promote nutrient availability and enhance tolerance to abiotic and biotic stress. And in the work we've done for this project, we've, we've shown that, that agriculture uses and biostimulants are an attractive category for polyphenols. And it's part of quite a large market worth around approaching 500 million euros and growing in Europe and in North America, you know, approaching 300 million euros, growing at 14% per year. So it's an important category. The final market which we've looked at is uh, personal care. And I've put within and without, because there's not only topical applications for cosmetics, which include cosmetics which just have a cosmetic effect, but also cosmeceuticals, which have a benefit beyond the cosmetic effect, so a health promoting effect. But there's also beauty from within, which is a relatively small but growing category among supplements. So that's improving skin health by taking dietary supplements by ingesting them. So you can see the gruff the figure here has inside the body and outside the body, Nutri cosmetics, cosmetics, dietary supplements, and cosmeceuticals. So polyphenols have applications in all these markets and part of CPL's work during this project has been identifying which markets they can be best positioned to be sold in, the projects from the polyphenols from the Purep project. So the major markets for personal care are EU and North America and <coughs> main, main effects for which they're used are antioxidants and preservatives in skin care, so that's a purely functional effect but also in terms of their health effects, promoting and promoting anti-aging, and also there's various other claims that can be made. So now I'm going to talk a bit, having covered the markets, I think I can conclude from that, but the markets are, are large and interesting. So there is, there is an out, outlet for polyphenols should you wish to valorize them. But now I'm going to talk a bit about the process of valorizing side streams. So the first question is, why should you valorize your side stream? I think Michael's covered some of this already, but the first reason obviously to meet corporate social responsibility standards and green credentials, reduce your waste processing costs, create products of value, and the most important thing, increase profitability. So it isn't a new thing. Obviously products like yeast from brewing have been valorized for a long time, and now brewer's yeast can be split up into a number of different fractions with quite specific uses. For example, yeast cell walls are used to stimulate the immune system. Yeast extracts are used as flavorings in foods. There's nucleotides which go into infant nutrition. Glutathione, which has various pharmaceutical uses, but is also good for skin health. And then there's high IMP GMP extracts, which are used as a replacement for MSG. So lots of good stuff comes from yeast. And the same is the case for whey. Whey used to be considered as a side stream produced from sea, from cheese. But now, now people say that cheese is the side stream and whey is the product of value. And you can see in the diagram there, there's a huge amount of things you can get from whey. It's a, it's a big industry. And I think in general, from our own perspective in consulting, is that companies come to us and they now think of themselves more as biorefiners than as single product companies. They often look at everything they have, every side stream, and try and valorize that to its fullest extent. So, <clears throat> what are some of the mis misconceptions? I mean, people assume that side streams are free, but they're not. Everything has a cost as soon as you do anything to it, and every process processing step adds more cost. And depending on what you have to do, the final product may be very costly. So that's, that's a very important consideration when you come to looking at your side streams. The second thing, is that people assume that the products that you have, there'll be a, a ready market for it and the market will be crying out for it. That's often not the case, especially in, in sectors like the food industry, where they often make do with the ingredients they have and it's quite difficult to convince them to change. The third thing is that people assume that they're the first person to have thought of this. But if you look through the patent literature and look through the trade press, people have been, have been uh, valorizing their side streams for many years. 
So it's worth checking to see what has been done, what technologies are already available, and who's already out there. So how do you find the value in your side streams? There's three questions. What do you have? What is, what is it worth? And who's going to buy it? So the first one, what do you have? You may have a number of side streams with specific properties in terms of their constituents, their concentrations, and the volumes available. The first choice you have to make is what starting material do you use? You'll have to consider how it's been processed, handled, and stored, as this may determine the markets where derivatives can eventually go into. For example, is the processing food grade? Then you have to look at the components which are in there, and they need to be prioritized in terms of their availability, their potential value, and the likelihood to produce a commercial product at the end of the process. So these are things that you've had to consider during the Purex project. So when you're looking at a side stream, there are various methods which you can use to analyze them to see which polyphenols are in there. But if possible, you should use validated standard, tree, standard industry methods. And if, if some components do not have standard methods, then you're going to have to spend time adapting existing methods or developing your own methodologies. So this can add extra cost. So CPL has done a lot of work in helping people prioritize what they can get out of their various side streams. We have this method called non-parametric analysis, which produces heat map. And we have a couple of other tools that you use here. But it's, it's something which takes a while to work out exactly what you have and what it's worth pursuing. That's the first big decision to make. So where is the value? Which products and which markets? You may be able to sell the same product into a number of markets with differential pricing strategies. You may have some low-hanging fruit markets. You may have some high-value markets. But it's important to try and get a map together of where you're going to sell what. And you have to fully understand the market dynamics. I mean, we have a saying which says, the further away from the market you are, the more attractive it looks. So things to consider. You have to differentiate your potential product. You have to add more value. I mean, perhaps this can include doing health trials. Should you sell the whole extract or just the specific, specific components? So in some markets, having a whole entire extract may be more valuable than having a concentrate. It just depends where exactly you're planning on selling it. There's also the question of, can you save money in processing by selling a, a wet product rather than drying it out? And then another important question is, do you have a, enough capacity to serve your customers? I mean, some large customers, they, they require well, not only enough capacity, they also require redundancy, so you have that more than one production site. So these are, these are important things to consider. So how much money will you make the size of a prize? So the largest and fast and growing markets may not necessarily be the best. It depends on who and what you're competing with. Then you've got to actually chase real markets. We've seen in business plans people coming up with the market, which is the global obesity market. That doesn't actually exist. There's a number of different parts. There's products produced for slimming. There's exercise. There's various things which all sort of feed into treating obesity, but there is no global obesity market. And usually they say this is worth several hundreds of billion pounds, and they're going to get 1% of it, which obviously wouldn't necessarily be the case. So working out the potential market takes time and effort. And you have to use a bottom-up and top-down analysis, and then actually compare it with companies already in the market and do a reality check, see how much, them, how much money they're making. And also look at how much you'd have to sell in order to satisfy a certain number of customers based on the, the, <coughs> the effective dose of a product that you're looking at. The third thing is the prices which you find may not be the actual prices paid. I mean, I've seen some business plans where they use the laboratory reagent prices, which is a bit of a basic mistake, which can sometimes be a thousand times the price of a bulk product. So <clears throat> one way you can add value is through science and through validating health claims. And ingredients with demonstrable health effects may achieve significant 
premiums. There have been problems in Europe because EFSA approval is quite slow and expensive and requires pharmaceutical levels of proof. So many companies have been using softer health claims, relying on the halo surrounding established healthy ingredients. So for example, with the, with the apple extracts, they're banking on the fact that consumers know that apples are good for them and they'll presume that an apple extract will be even better if it's concentrated. The important thing is that trials must produce the right kind of data for the purpose. So if you're doing them to support marketing, then you should have certain endpoints. If you're going for an EFSA health claim, you have to be really careful and make sure everything is done perfectly. You have to choose the correct endpoints, so what you're measuring during the trials. And if you measure multiple endpoints, you can avoid doing extra trials if you want to make further claims. And simple, cheap tests can establish effects or prove proof of concept. And there's one interesting company we've come across during the Purit project called Sibelius, which uses a nematode, C. elegans, to assess the properties of dietary supplement ingredients. And they have a really interesting uh, assay which they can use to help, help look at health effects. One of the, you have a next question is, uh, which customers will buy the product? You have to really understand the market and you have to understand what people's buying behavior are, is, sorry. Buying behavior may be very complex and having a cheaper product does not necessarily mean it will be more desirable. I mean, the key motivator in dietary supplements is actually differentiation. There's thousands of ingredients available. There's a large number of brand holders, as they're called, all vying for space on the supplement shops, shelves, <clears throat> and what they want is differentiation. They want to have something on the front of their supplement which makes it stand out. So this is something which you should, which you can aim for when you're valorizing health ingredients. The next question is to consider the route to market. So valorizing a co-stream will often take a company into totally uncharted territory. I mean, we've worked for craft pulpers producing paper, looking at side streams from a, from a craft, pulsing, craft pulping process. So they obviously knew, knew nothing at all about the food ingredient space. And often, the way in which different sectors operate is totally different to what you, your usual understanding of your own sector. So you have to be very careful in how you approach the market and, and what you do. Also, you have to decide on the best route to market. So using distributors, companies already in the business, direct sale to large customers. Some partners may demand exclusivity. And if you get this wrong, it could be a big opportunity cost. You could shut yourself out from really big markets by going with the wrong partner. Choosing the right partner is critical. So many co-stream products will be very specialist in their nature and will require specialist selling, selling skills. And the partner you choose may ultimately determine the success of your side stream product. So this is something which CPL has been working on in the Purit project. I mean, I expect many of the people who are on this webinar today are people we've approached talking to about the Purit, Purit project in an attempt to find interested partners. Um, so, in conclusion, effective side stream valorization can be important in maximizing profitability. And it can also be very good for your green credentials as well. It can reduce your wa waste processing costs. There is a big market out there. There's a global demand for polyphenols. And we think it will continue to be robust and will continue to grow in the future. And <clears throat> there's also a, an interesting environment and many health benefits of polyphenols, which can be used in order to sell these products into that market. Successful implementation of a valorization project requires very careful planning and prioritization. And this is something which CPL has worked on for many clients in the past and will continue in future years. So thank you very much. Cheers, Robert. Thanks very much for that. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Yeah, it's really good, really interesting, and thanks very much for everyone staying online. It's um, a very good attendance today, so thank you to everyone. We've got a question that's come in, and before I ask it, and while I'm asking it, 
Um, if anyone else has any questions to add, then please do put them in. And probably the question box is probably the best place for it, but equally you can put it into chat as well. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask any, any questions now. And as I said, the guys will be available. Obviously, you can follow them up them afterwards. And we'll be sharing both recording and the slides um, afterwards as well. Um, so, Robert, I've got a feeling this might be for you, but perhaps Michael can chip in as well. Um, one of the questions we've had from, uh, from Ross Campbell is what's the regulatory situation vis-a-vis -vis novel foods directive? Uh, so there's a test for you. Hello, Sorry, Robert. I was on mute, I was, I was on mute then. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were stunned by the uh, by the question. <laughs> well, I think for yeah for novel foods, obviously this depends on the source material. It depends on the degree of processing, and <clears throat> it's yeah, and it's, it's something which you could answer more fully offline, I think. But it's it's certainly certainly something which has to be looked at, and something which is very important in looking at an ingredient. Okay. Because it's, it's well, Ross, a costly to get to get through novel foods is a costly process. Right. Well, Ross, if you wanted to pick that up with uh, Robert afterwards or Michael, then 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 please do. Um, an obvious question, I think, is really what's the next phase of this project now? I mean, what are you what are you asking and, and interested in people to do? Okay. So, uh, can you hear me there, Ali? Yeah. Fine, Michael. Yeah. Yeah, so I suppose we, I'll maybe deal with that a little bit more in detail towards the end of the presentation. If I, if I run through, I have I have some more slides to run through. So if we run through that, then then we'll take um, we we'll take the, the remainder of the questions. I suppose just a, a final comment just to to, to um, answer also um, Ross's question. Um, basically, I, I suppose it depends on the application you're pointing to polyphenols at as well in terms of the, the, the degree of regulation as well. So there are um, different applications, whether they're food, whether they're um, uh, cosmetics, whether they're feed, etc. And all of those applications have different regulations associated with them. So um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to run through things very, very briefly. But I suppose I wanted to to, to show um, the the the, the skid we've actually uh, developed and the process that we've developed. So very very quickly, um, we have. Uh, a pure up skid, which is essentially two skids, um, and a skid is for those not who are not engineers. A skid is, is a, a, a a a piece of equipment that uh, everything is, is on the one frame, and it's, it's it's mobile and it can be moved around from one side to another. So this project is it was about commercial demonstration of polyphenol production, um, and and what we've done is we've produced. Two skids that effectively we can we can move around from site to site and they've been on two sites currently um, and they can do produce polyphenols at demonstration scale but to commercial quality. And this is one of the big issues that was was inhibiting polyphenol coming new polyphenol extracts coming on the market because people couldn't produce commercial quality um, at, at at kind of reasonable scale to to give to the the customers who are interested in buying them. So this is, this is something we've addressed with. with with the, the equipment we've developed, um, I suppose a comment that came up earlier as well is in terms of you know uh, we've there's a lot of, of, of background information, background expertise and information gone into this. There's a whole lot of analysis which has led us to uh, and fed into the design of our kids. The analytical side of it is a whole other presentation, and we're not even going to get into that today. And uh, we're happy to kind of discuss offline with people if anyone has any specific queries. Um, we also did a, a, a thorough kind of technology and patent screening to see what other um, equipment was out there for producing polyphenols and other extracts. So what we have essentially is a combination of two processes, so membranes and an absor absorption process. And uh, so the, the, where the real smarts are in this is how to identify the proper source material and how, how to deal with it, and then managing the process parameters within our system to avoid denaturing the polyphenols and the, the antioxidant activity within those uh, within that source material. So just moving on to my next slide here. Um, for some reason this is yeah. Okay. So basically source site benefits. We talked about kind of the, the, the headline of this was the business case. So 
you know, what are the benefits for the source site? So there's obviously potential to reduce the volume of organic material going down to drains, which essentially saves, is a saving on effluent costs. Um, we talked about good environmental story and reduced environmental footprint. Uh, potential for recovering water and caustic back to site. And uh, potential for producing a high value add added co-product co from the site. And in terms of looking at this uh, from a waste perspective and looking at the, the, the kind of waste hierarchy, producing things like nutraceuticals uh, from material is much better than sticking it into an anaerobic digester or than comp uh, composting it or combusting it. Um, so the higher up the, the waste hierarchy you can go, the better. So this certainly what we're looking at doing with this is and, and keeping the material that essentially started out as food, keeping within the food chain is, is, is a good thing from an environmental point of view to do. Um, so just, and I won't dwell on this slide, but this is the sort of level of detail, and it's much more detailed in behind this. Um, but it's basically looking at a thousand liters of pot ale, which is post distillation residue from uh, whiskey production, and um, essentially there's a lot of water in there, and we're pulling out the polyphenols um, out of it. So there's quite there's a very small amount of polyphenols relatively in this, but they have good activity and good functional activity. Um, so. Beer is, is, is a bit different in terms of what we looked at. So beer, effectively, we're taking something that doesn't have a, is not currently a co-product, something that, that's a pure waste, and we're it, 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 it's wastewater going to drain, and we're capturing that and stripping polyphenols out of it. So again, different slide, but I left it out in the interest of time. Um, just then about kind of cost benefit and calculation, and um, how do you go about this? Every site is different. Every substrate that you're looking at is different, uh, and it's something that, that, that has to be calculated and, and has to be done for each individual site we're looking at. Uh, we've built, as part of our project, we've built a, a very detailed model on this that is kind of, we can customize per site and take in all the inputs um, and, and look at that, and then we have the analytical uh, process in place where basically we can, somebody comes and says, I have this liquid going down the drain, uh, I think there's polyphenols in, in it, we can evaluate it, we can look at it from, um, from a, a, a technical point of view, from an analysis point of view, we can, uh, Robert's team can look at it from a commercial point of view, we can produce a dem demo scale um, and produce then a, a, a kind of commercial demo, demo scale using our pure scale, and then we can take it with partners, we can take it through the whole functional testing process, um, and we actually have some companies that we're talking to at the moment who um, could potentially take it through to address kind of Ross's uh, question could potentially take it through the novel food um, process and would be interested in that for if, if there's sufficient, if there's the right type of ingredients coming through. Um, so, and, and then just a comment on this, and I hope to have a slide on this, but again, in the interest of time, I left it out. So, um, we, we've done a thorough life cycle analysis on this, and uh, we have extremely positive life cycle analysis results on uh, the extracts that we've produced from the sites that we've produced. And it's worth noting that they were quite dilute samples in terms of con contents of polyphenols. So if we're going somewhere that has a higher polyphenol content in the source material, uh, we would expect significantly better life cycle analysis results. So it's a good thing from an environmental point of view, which is, which is good to hear at the end of the project. Um, just looking at, at kind of other polyphenol recovery opportunities, so other alcohol production processes, so cognac, brandy, Rum, rum is quite an interesting one. There's quite a, a, a the, the post distillation residue that's left from over from rum is called dunder, and it's quite a challenging issue for rum producers. Um, it gets it, it, it's quite funky from a, a, a bacterial point of view and uh, can be difficult to deal with. Um, so sugar cane residues in themselves uh, have have significant amounts of polyphenols in them. Also, wine leaves, so these are, this is something we're looking at as well, and cider production residues. And then into, into other kind of waste streams, so looking at coffee, tea processing, um, cocoa processing, juice and pulp production. So I know there's some people on the line who've done uh, some work in this area, um, and basically the, 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 the water coming out of, wash water, et cetera, coming out of those um, industries can be, can be quite interesting from a polyphenol point of view. And then non-food biomass, so I have a picture of seaweed there. Again, I know there are people on, on the uh, webinar who've, who've de dealt with seaweed. There's also things like um, agricultural residues as well. So um, just going 
down. So again, we're if, if anyone is looking at these type of um, materials, we're, we're obviously very interested in talking to them. And then just to I suppose to 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 finish up to look at um, where uh, where where we would see this going. I mean, um, pure uh, as a process is designed to strip out polyphenols and to recover polyphenols, and polyphenols can be one part of a business case. Um, we would see, a, 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 you know, an ideal production facility where you're recovering more than just one particular ingredient. So potentially you're recovering proteins. Potentially you're recovering in a distillery, as, as the example here. Potentially you're recovering water back to the process. Potentially you're recovering the waste heat. Waste heat can go into a greenhouse. You produce CO2 from fermentation. That CO2 can also go into a greenhouse. Uh, if you have an anaerobic digester, your waste heat can can help. Support that, um, the, that that anaerobic digester, and the the biogas can go back to the site. And then, obviously, um, as you, you you can move and um, take things up the value chain from current kind of animal feed direct to, to pigs, to producing high value ingredients into aquaculture, producing cosmetic ingredients, producing functional foods, and um, if you can move up into the human human nutraceuticals. And, and get health claims against something, then obviously there's, there's significantly higher value involved. Um, so I think that is all I had, and we're, we're, I suppose we're open to questions. This, this slide is, is very much the kind of ideal world, and I think um, but it's, it's, it's how we should be thinking, and I think I know Ali it ties in with the sort of Manufacture 2030 stuff that you, you guys are doing as well. Um, so just my last slide then is just how to, how to contact us. We will be doing further updates on our website um, and keep an eye on our Twitter as well because we, uh, we'll be, at the, the project is ending but the, the story will go on so um, um, if you're interested please please keep an eye on that and um, also um, please feel free to get in touch with, it with either myself or Robert from CTL as well. Thanks very much Michael. Yeah and as I said I think uh, having followed this for, for some time it's fascinating that you've got this far and uh, uh, congratulations to you guys on, on doing that. And as I said, certainly for us with Manufacture 2030, the fact that we're matching up people's wage streams with their resource needs all the time is something that this is of great interest to us and, and our partners uh, on the platform. So, yeah, no, it's, uh, thanks very much to both yourself and Robert. Um, I don't think there's been any more questions, but there's still plenty of people hanging on. If there, anyone wants to ask a question now, do so or forever hold your peace. Um, or, as I said, get in touch with Michael or, or Robert. And do keep, um, as I say, following Pure Up on Twitter uh, as they go and talk about what they're doing around the world uh, at the moment. But um, no, I don't think there's any more questions, guys. So yeah, thanks very much for that. Um, and any more thoughts, Michael or Robert? Or otherwise, um, we'll, we'll let everyone go. Yeah, no, just uh, I'd like to thank everyone who, who, who dialed in and uh, listened in. And um, yeah, please feel free to, to, to get in touch and uh, contact us um, if you have any, any, any further queries or any more detailed queries. We're happy to take them offline. Great stuff. Well, thank you, chaps. Thank you to everyone around the world, and, um, and no doubt see you soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.